Hi everyone. Uh, today we're going to go over periodic table trends. So this is part one of this topic. Um, it's pretty long. It's really theoretical, so it'll take a little while to get through it here. Uh, so this is lesson number 2.7. All right, uh, so right away, this, this definition is actually a little, about halfway down your note sheet there, but this word here, I'm going to try to say it, it's a, I, I, I have trouble saying this word, uh, so periodicity. Periodicity uh, just refers to periodic properties. So these are properties that happen um, in a very regular way. So, so we can predict them, they're, they're periodic in that they keep happening. Um, and these are all the relationships that we're gonna go through for, for this um, lesson. So obviously you don't need to write this down, we're gonna put them all together. But you might wanna get yourself a periodic table, you could use the one we used um, for um, for the, the, sorry, the electron configuration, or there's also one at, right at the top of your sheet uh, in that booklet that has electronegativities on it. You could also use that one. So, so or if your regular periodic table, it doesn't matter to me. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to go through is here is called Doberiner triads. So these are elements in a triad, in a, sorry, in a triad that have similar properties. Um, and so they're highlighted on this periodic table here, if you can see them. So we've got these trios here of, of elements. Um, so the example that I'm gonna we're, I'm gonna talk about here are calcium, strontium, and barium. Um, so if we look at that, so that's these ones here, calcium, strontium, and barium. Uh, if we look at those right there, uh, the mass of stront strontium, for example, is the average of the masses of calcium and barium. And so we see we have these triplets throughout the periodic table where we have certain properties um, that are the same or have different commonalities to them here. Okay, uh, next we're going to look at law of octaves. So this is John Newlands. Uh, and so music people, um, you will know how many notes would, would an octave be? And that would be eight, right? Uh, of course, we can figure that out just by looking at the prefix here, OCT. But uh, th what this is, is that every eighth element has similar properties if we arranged if we arrange the elements by mass, okay? Um, so this is just an example of this. You don't need to know any specific examples from this. I just wanted you to know that that existed. Um, now we have the modern periodic table, of course, is what we use today. Um, these elements are arranged by increasing atomic number. Uh, families have the same valence electrons, so valence being the outermost electrons, and they also would contain or have similar properties. Now, the advantages of, of arranging our periodic table how we have it is that we can predict behavior of the elements. So by looking at a family that an element um, is in, we can pr make predictions about the behavior of certain types of, of, of the element based on, on where it's located. Uh, so one thing we really like about that is that it saves memorizing facts. Um, I know there were some like really old school um, university professors who would make students memorize the periodic table, which I always thought was crazy. Why would I memorize it? It's literally everywhere, right? It's right in front of me and no need to memorize that. Um, disadvantages, of course, uh, one of the main ones here, there's really no good place for hydrogen. Um, so as you know, and on your periodic table, the hydrogen is right at the top there of the, and then underneath it, we've got the, um, uh, the, the metals, right? Um, Alkali metals. Oh my god, I totally forgot the name of that family. I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna have to stop the video. This is embarrassing. <laughs> so the alkali metals are there. Now hydrogen is not part of the alkali metals, um, it, but it, we put it there because it does have one outer electron, but it doesn't really behave like the other ones, right? So we've got lithium at the top here, um, and so the other the alkali metals behave differently than hydrogen. So, so that's a disadvantage of our modern periodic table here. Uh, first concept we're really going to talk about here is ionization energy, so abbreviated IE here. So if something ionizes, um, it's going to become an ion, right? So this is the energy required to remove one electron from the valence shell of a neutral atom in the vapor state, okay? Um, now the general equation here, so we've got X, X being the element, so X naught, you would say that, or X zero, so a neutral element. If we add energy to it, <coughs> excuse me, we will end up having our ion, so our X plus, so this would be a metal having a positive charge, 
plus our electron case. So that would be the general formula here. Now, so this is the energy required to take one electron off of the valence of an atom, right? Now, the second ionization energy is the energy required to remove a second electron from the valence shell. This is going to be higher than the first, okay? So, um, if for example, if we looked at, well, let's look at lithium. Lithium, we know, would have a 1s2, or if we want to look at the old Bohr model, right, two electrons in the first shell, and then in the second, it has one. So basically, what this is saying is there's a certain amount of ionization energy to lose that first electron, and it's probably pretty easy. Lithium wants to get rid of that electron, right? So it's, doesn't, it's not going to require a whole lot of energy for it to lose one electron. However, the second ionization energy, um, so if I wanted to remove this one, that's gonna be a lot harder, okay? So it's gonna require a lot more ionization energy to get the second electron off there, okay? And this does give, give us information about uh, what families um, an element would be in, right, based on the ionization energies. Uh, so if we look at this chart here, this is a chart of first ionization energies. So as you can see, helium, so we've got our noble gases up at the top. The noble gases do not want anything to do with, with gaining or losing electrons, right? They are happy how they are. Um, so the ionization energy would be quite high then for the noble gases. And if we look down here, um, we've got our alkali metals here. And then as we, uh, this is um, atomic number on the x-axis here. So we've got lithium here. So right next door to lithium is beryllium. So that would be, um, hold on here, that would be right here, so that's beryllium. And then as we move on through the periodic table, we can see the different um, ionization energies and, and uh, for the first ionization level, okay? Now, uh, electrons, sorry. So for example, so we're just gonna copy, you can copy down these, um, you can copy down these uh, values in your notes here. So we've got the elements. We're going to go look at lithium, sodium, potassium, and rubidium. And so hopefully you have noticed that these are all group one elements. Okay, so these are in the same family, the alkali metals. Um, now this is the first ionization energy. Now EV stands for electron volt, um, and it's just a, a unit for measuring the energy here. So don't worry about that. We're, we're more worried about um, the trends. So what's actually happening here? So as we can see, what's happening to the ionization energy as we move down a family? Yeah, and so the elect the ionization energy is decreasing as we move down a family, right? Now the second ionization energies, as you'll see, are significantly higher, right? This is only around five. This is 75. So huge difference there, right? Um, so second ionization energies, again, just know they are often um, quite a bit larger, particularly for our group one here, right? Because um, they really only want to lose one electron. Uh, now, there are four factors that affect the ionization energy, so four reasons why we have differences. Um, and as you can see, this is going to explain why the ionization energy here is going down as we move from lithium to rubidium, so move down a family. Uh, so the first thing uh, is the atomic number. So this, of course, with all other factors being constant or ignored, so not particularly useful. but. <laughs> excuse me, the greater the atomic number, the bigger the nuclear charge, right? So if we've got a large atomic number, that means that the nucleus is going to be more, have a stronger positive charge. Um, this is going to lead to greater ionization energy because that positive nucleus is going to be holding in uh, the electrons because again, uh, obviously positive and negative charges attract. So they're gonna be, so a more positive nucleus is going to hold in electrons. Uh, sorry. Uh, for part B here, we've got atomic radius. So this is a chart showing we took out the transmission, the transmission transition metals are taken out here. But if we look at this slide here, this picture, we can see what's happening to the atomic radius as we move um, through a family. So as we move here, it's getting larger, right? Um, and as we move across, it's actually getting less. Now this feels a little counterintuitive because you're adding electrons as you move across, right? Across a period. 
but you have to remember as we're moving across, the, the fact, factor A comes into effect because that nuclear charge is increasing, right? So you're getting a, a more strongly positive center and it's going to hold in those electrons, hold in the electron cloud tighter, which is why our, our uh, atomic radius is going to decrease as we move across a period here. Now the atomic radius, sorry, I should have put this up before, this is the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. And the greater the radius, the smaller the ionization energy. So uh, the greater, you're going to cheese grate your radius, I guess. Uh, the greater, sorry, the greater the radius, the smaller the ionization energy. Um, and this is just because it's further away, right? So, so if the radius is bigger, the electrons are farther away from that positive nucleus. So it's going to be easier to remove them. Okay, thirdly here, part C, we have what's called the shielding effect. Um, so the shielding effect is the, is the interference created when the inner electrons block the nucleus's attraction for valence electrons. So we talked about how this positive nucleus here is, is wanting to yank in the electrons to it, but if we have other electrons in between, you're going to get some repulsion uh, because negative charges don't like each other, right? So like charges are going to repel. So when you have a bunch of electrons in here, they're going to shield these outer electrons from that positive nucleus. Um, and that's going to have an impact on the ionization energy. And in fact, the greater the shielding, the less the ionization energy. So the more shielding there is, the easier it is for that electron to leave the atom. Okay, part D. So the number of occupied orbitals in the sublevels. Um, this is this also has an effect here. So the more sublevels, or sorry, orbitals that are filled, the higher the ionization energy. Basically, orbitals want to be filled. Atoms like full shells. They like full orbitals. Um, so the more that are filled the higher the ionization energy. So I want you to here put these in order. So you can pause the video and try that on your own here. So which one's going to be the least, so the lowest ionization energy, and then to the highest. Okay, here's your answer. So scandium is going to be the lowest, and that's because it's only got one d filled there. Only one d orbital, um, sorry, is um, is occupied, and so it's going to get rid of that pretty quick. So that's a pretty. It's going to have a fairly low ionization energy comparatively. Uh, next is going to be mag. Oops, sorry is magnesium because we've got our 3s2 and then lastly the highest ionization energy is going to be zinc um, zinc is pretty happy with that full d sublevel there all of its orbitals are filled it doesn't really want to get rid of those um, so that's going to be the highest ionization energy there okay so <coughs> excuse me summary for ionization energy um, so we have ionization energy decreases within a family Now, this is because of increasing atomic radii and the greater shielding effect, okay? So decreases within a family. So what this means is as you move down a family, your ionization energy is going to decrease, okay? Oops, ah, yeah, number two, sorry. Ionization energy increases across a period. Um, and so the greater the nuclear charge, the stronger the attraction. That's where that's coming from. Uh, noble gases, uh, just talk about this for a second. They have the highest ionization energies of any family, so they do not want to lose any electrons. The alkali metals have the lowest. They do want to get rid of one electron. And then uh, it's important to note that increases in ionization energy are parallel with increases in non-metallic properties, okay? So the more non metal-esque something is, the, um, the higher the ionization energies are going to be. So you can add these arrows onto your periodic table here. So you want to know that ionization energy decreases as you move down a family and increases as you move across a period, okay? Now, number two that we're going to talk about is called electron affinity. Um, so Electron affinity, this is the energy that is released when a neutral atom accepts an electron. So instead of getting taking or sorry, getting rid of an electron, we're accepting an electron at this point. So the general equation, we have our x0 
plus an electron is going to yield energy plus the anion, so the ion that is negatively charged there. Um, so this is only true generally for nonmetals. Um, and electron affinity increases across a period. Oh yeah, there we go. Increases across a period and it decreases within a family. Um, metals have low electron affinity, nonmetals have high electron affinity. So the nonmetals, they want extra electrons essentially. Um, so you can put these arrows on here. So increasing electron affinity as we move across a period and increasing electron affinity as we move up um, a family here. Oh, geez, that's it. I did not expect that to be done so fast. <laughs> okay, I guess I stopped there. Um, so we're going to do the atomic radius and, and we'll do the next one in our next lesson. Uh, you can look through that booklet of assignment. There might be some of the stuff that you can do there, but um, in a way you kind of need to wait till we have more, more of the concepts here. So um, you can take a look through that booklet. Otherwise, uh, you can just wait till, till you get the next lesson on this. Okay, thanks everyone.